Good afternoon, everyone. Well, welcome back to our Fundamentals of Organizing and Writing Academic Research Paper. I hope you had a good uh, long uh, weekend. Uh, for those celebrated Hari Raya, Selamat Hari Raya to you and welcome back. Uh, I'm still on leave actually, but I'm, I'm still going to do the session today. Prof. Brian is away, uh, so I will be handling the session today with uh, Ms. Pyroniza. So today's session is uh, very much going to focus on the, on the next aspect of writing academic research paper, which is the results component. Okay. Uh, so we have done over the past uh, six sessions on choosing a topic, preparing to write abstract writing, writing introduction, and writing the literature review uh, section of the paper and also the methodology in our last session. So today uh, is going to be focused on results. For those of you who have missed the previous session, uh, please contact us. Uh, we have recorded every session, so you are able to get uh, access to it. So, so please be informed. Today's session is also recorded. Although the number of participants today is very few, uh, we have almost 45 who have registered. So all those who have registered, they will get access to the recording. Um, so, so don't worry about it. Um, so as I've said, uh, both myself and Ms. Paruniza will handle the session uh, today. So, uh, the session basically will look at uh, uh, two main aspects. Uh, the first part I will present to you on the fundamentals of writing, uh, the result section of your publication, and then how do you present and organize your results uh, chapter or your sections in the paper, and then how do you use uh, all the non-textual elements? Okay, when I say non-textual elements your tables and figures and images, how do you use it in a publication to present your results? And then the second part, Ms. Pyroniza will, will take you through uh, on the library support uh, in terms of uh, some of the resources that is available to help you to manage your results. All right, so let's now look at uh, the first part, uh, how to organize your results section of a research paper uh, using good uh, non-textual uh, elements. So before I start, uh, just to recap, uh, in our last few classes, we have actually gone through the different aspects of the publication. Uh, you know, the anatomy of the research paper consists of right from the top, the title, the abstract, including the, the, uh, um, uh, the keywords that you use, and then comes your introduction, the knowledge gap, uh, then the rationale or hypothesis of why you're doing a particular research. And then we have also done in the last class on the methodology. Um, and then if you look at most publication, uh, you may not have the literature review as a section. The literature review is actually part of the introduction, okay, introduction chapter. Having said that, you will realize the literature review will actually appear even in your results, in your discussion and in your conclusion. You will always refer back to your literature. So what we're going to focus today is on the fifth area of the uh, publication, which is your results. Okay, What results did you get? So that is basically what we are trying to uh, focus on today. So the results section of, uh, of any scientific research paper uh, represents the, uh, the core findings of a study derived from the methods uh, applied to gather and analyze the information. So it presents these findings uh, in, a, in a very logical sequence without bias or, or interpretation from the author. Okay, so it sets up the reader for the later interpretation which will appear in the discussion section. So in the result section, you normally don't interpret, you just read it as it is without any biasness. A major purpose of the uh, result section is to break down the data into sentences that show its significance to the research question. So your result section must present the finding based on how you have structured your research question. So the result section appears uh, uh, in the third section sequence in most scientific papers. So it follows the presentation uh, of the method uh, or methodology section. After that, you have your results. 
it is normally presented before the, dis uh, the discussion section. So although the result and uh, discussions are, are presented together in some publications, this section uh, uh, will answer, the result section, whichever way you write it, basically uh, uh, answers uh, you the questions on, on, on what did you find in your research and, and, and how are you, the, the presentation or the evaluation of the, the findings will be done in the discussion. So here you just focus on what did you find in the, res in the research and, and hence it must be written in a past tense because the research have already been conducted. So remember that uh, when you talk about uh, your results section, whatever result you get, okay, the findings that you have is to prove the finding, the actual, the, the result section basically proves the findings of your experiment or findings of your survey or finding of your interview, okay? So the result, the research results can only confirm or reject the research problem that is underpinning the, your study, okay? So that is the main aim. So you don't write something that's totally non-related to your research question that you're trying to prove here. So however, the, the act of uh, articulating the result helps you to understand the problem within, to break it into pieces and also to view the research problem uh, from different perspectives. So the page length of this section uh, is set by the amount of amount and the type of data that you're going to report. So, so not in most publication, there is a limitation how much you can write. So you have to be very concise, use uh, non-textual elements such as figures and tables, if appropriate, to present the results more effectively. So in deciding uh, what data to describe in your results section, you must clearly distinguish materials that would normally be included in a research paper from any raw data or other material that could be included as an appendix to decide what comes into the paper, what remains in the appendix. Okay, so you don't put uh, a lot of raw data in the main text, only it's very selective. So in general, raw data should not be included in the main text of your paper unless uh, there is a real need. So uh, avoid providing data that is not critical to answering the research question. When you run a quantitative research, especially when you're running an SPSS uh, analysis, you'll get a lot of data. Don't take every single data the SPSS produce and dump it in the paper. Don't do that. Be selective. The background information you describe uh, in the introduction uh, section of your paper should provide the reader with any additional context or explanation needed uh, to understand the result. So you don't repeat what you have written in the result in the introduction, in the result. A good rule is to always uh, reread the background section or your introduction ch chapter uh, of your before you start writing your results so that you will be sure, rest assured that your result is going to tie back to the introduction. So how you interpret your result uh, will actually appear in the discussion section. So don't put too much in the results section. So in terms of the structure and approach of results section of your publication, most research, uh, for most uh, research paper format, there are two ways uh, of presenting and organizing the result. Okay, you would have noticed this as well. The first option is you present the results followed by a short explanation of the findings, meaning to say your, uh, you may have, uh, you may, let's say for example, you may have noticed an, uh, an unusual correlation between uh, uh, two variables during the analysis of your findings. So it is correct to point this out in the result section. However, speculating as to why the correlation exists and offering a, a hypothesis about what may be happening, that component will belong to the discussion section of your paper, okay? So you only give the outright result. Don't do much discussion in the result section of the paper. So that is one way of writing. Another way of writing is you present a section, okay, a section of the study, and then discuss it immediately. Then you go to the next section, discuss it immediately. So if you see in some publication, it is called results and discussion as a header. Okay, 
In that case, you have to do, you have to present the results and discussion at the same time. So you will see this uh, normally in longer papers. Okay, if the paper is extremely long, they may not want to break down the results and discussion because if they just present the result, result, result without discussion, you may forget when you come to the discussion, what was the result all about? So what they do is they do it result discussion, result discussion. So they do it that way. So, so, so you have different ways of how you can actually pre, uh, present your finding. So the discussion section should generally flow the same flow of your information uh, chosen in presenting the result. So if in your result, you start off with the demographic data findings, and then you go to the general finding, and then you go to the, the more micro findings, your discussion will be in the same format. So your discussion will also start off with that demographic discussion, a discussion on the demographic data, and then the general data analysis, and then the details. So you follow the same flow. So that's how you write your result section. So if you look at the contents of the results section, what should you include? So there are a few important elements that you need to uh, include. So an introductory context uh, must be included for understanding the result by restating the research problem. So remember, your result section is just trying to link your findings to the research question. So you try to state briefly in the introductory con uh, in the introductory of the result section on the research question. A summary of your key findings should then be arranged in a logical sequence um, that generally follow your methodology section. If you look at your methodology, in your methodology, you would have talked about the kind of analysis you're doing in certain sequence. You have to follow the same sequence for your result. So don't just randomly put your result. Inclusion of non-textual elements, okay, such as figures, charts, um, photo, maps, tables, uh, all this can be illustrated uh, in the findings if it is appropriate. So be very careful. Uh, don't overdo it. Don't put the same information in the text, the same, and then don't have one table and one figure showing the same information. Just choose one option. So in the text, a systematic description of your result, highlighting uh, for the readers, observation uh, that are most relevant to the topic under investigation can be presented. Okay, Remember that uh, not all results uh, that emerge from the methodology that you use uh, to gather the data may be relevant. So you have to be very selective. What information you want to present, what is not important. Focus the findings only on uh, important and related uh, issues that is addressing your research problem. So if you look at the table uh, on the screen, uh, it just basically gives you the differences between the result section and discussion section. Okay, so the discussion section, we are going to be doing it in our next class. So you can you can read this table when you get this slide on how, what is the difference? So it's, one is just to present the what, what is your result all about? And the discussion is to, to, uh, to describe uh, what does the result basically mean? So what? Okay, so you need to justify the findings. The contents of the results section. So if the scope of the study is broad or if, you're, or if you studied uh, a variety of variables, okay, uh, or constructs in the study, or if the methodology used uh, uh, a wide range of different results, then the author normally should present only those results that are most relevant to the research question that is tied in the introductory introduction section of your paper. So, uh, so that is what you need to do always. Always go back to your introduction. As a general rule, any information that does not present the direct findings or outcome of the study should be left out. Okay, so don't try to put in something that is totally out of the way. Unless the journal requests the authors to combine the result and discussion section, explanation and interpretation should be omitted from the result, as I've said uh, earlier. So in terms of the non-textual element, uh, uh, so there are so many ways of using them. So first one, if you see the first bullet there, either place figures or table or charts within the text of the result. So when you are giving an explanation, immediately within the same area where you are explaining, the text should appear, uh, the, the image or the figures or table should appear, okay? So that is one way of doing them. 
if you see some publication, they will put all the figures and, and, and charts right at the back of the report or back of the publication. In some, okay, not all. But it depends. You have to you have to look at the publication content and what is the, the guideline that is provided uh, for you. In the in the text, refer to each non-textual element that is used in a numbered order. If you're using table one, table two, same. Then use chart one, chart two, figure one, figure two, not not sometimes you put table one and then you become figure A, B, C. Don't do that. If you put figure 1.1, 1.2, follow the same format. And you must always refer. Don't use a table or figure, but nowhere in the text you have talked about it. So then that figure or table is useless in the publication. You always refer. Table one basically shows what. So you have to explain that. So you don't just explain something without referring back to the figure or table. You must always refer. Regardless of placement, each non-textual element must be numbered and must have a proper caption. Okay, so the caption you follow the uh, the standard guidelines for the publication, whether it goes below the figures or above. Most tables, the caption will be at the top. Most figures, the caption will be at the bottom. But in some publication, it may be all standardized. So you have to see the publication. Um, so. Regardless of placement, each non-textual element must be uh, numbered. Okay, we mentioned that already. So, uh, uh, and also remember that whatever table or figure or any non-textual element that you're using, it should be it should be able to stand on its own. Meaning to say, what if I look at your table or your figure and I read your headings and information in the table or figure, I should be able to understand without reading your publication. If I had to read your publication to understand your figures, then your figure is designed poorly. Okay, so be careful when to use the figures and tables on when do not need to use it. So you have to be very careful to be very clear and clear. The importance of using a non-textual elements. Uh, okay, so you have so a picture, as you know, is worth a thousand words. So what by embedding. Uh, all the charts and tables and figures uh, into a research paper, it can bring uh, an added clarity to a study because it provides a clean, uh, concise way of reporting findings uh, that would uh, otherwise take several long paragraphs and boring paragraphs to, uh, to, uh, to explain. So that is why you use a, a non-textual element. Non-textual elements are also useful tools for summarizing information, especially when you have a great deal of data. So many you got so much of data to present. By just drawing a few graphs, it explains very clearly. So non-textual elements can help the reader grasp a large amount of data quickly and in a very orderly fashion. Non-textual elements also help you highlight important pieces of information without breaking up the narrative flow. So basically, all the illustration, photograph, map, and the like can be used as a, as a quick reference to information that helps to highlight key issues found in the text. For example, uh, you want to put a, a map. Okay, a street map can be used to show the distribution of, uh, of a health center facilities in a larger study documenting um, the struggle of, of a poor community or poor families to find adequate health center, let's say. Then you put a map there. So the people one look at the map, they understand, okay, what is the issue, the problem in this study. So non-textual elements are, are, are visually engaging. Using all this chart, it can help uh, enhance the overall presentation of your research and also uh, uh, provide a way to stimulate uh, your interest uh, in the study. It supports your key findings. Okay, so readers should be able to understand uh, non-textual element on their own without even having to refer to the text. That is what I mentioned to you earlier as well. So that's why it has to be very neatly designed. The labels are clear. It's simple enough. Uh, no abbreviation so that you, you, will, you are not lost by looking at the table of figures. So, so conversely, uh, the reader should not have to refer back and forth from the text to the figures to understand your, your paper. So some of the, the common non-textual elements that all of you have used and uh, have seen uh, uh, the figures. I'm not going to go through this, but you have seen all these you have used and you know when to use a figure, a flowchart, uh, a graph or chart, a histogram, 
and you also have illustration okay image illustration uh, can be a, a picture taken to, to explain something else or a graphical uh, map a pictograph a symbols table so there's so many ways you can actually mm -hmm. show your non-textual elements uh, of your results additional rules about using the non-textual element is uh, uh, the number of the figures or tables in the text should explicitly uh, be reference item meaning to say when you write your results avoid this kind of expression if you see here what's uh, given the example uh, in the first bullet here avoid expressions like in the chart on the following page or in the table below don't use the word in the following page below don't ever use that when you are referring to your uh, tables or figures you always refer it by the the, the caption the numbering okay so you always say like in the chart in uh, based on the based on figure number one then the following so don't use the word the following but use exactly the number in table three the following have been in table three what is being explained is actually referred so you refer back to the numbering it should be positioned as close as possible to where it is first mentioned in the text so if you're explaining something in a text as long as you have enough space within the paper within the page the same page you put the figures and table close to it okay you always put the figure and table after the explanation so that is a good practice not the other way around you don't want someone to read your paper and then suddenly your chart appear then you see where's the what is this chart about no one knows about it then suddenly when you open the next page ah then the explanation comes so it should always be the other way around explain then your figures or chart or table so each uh, non-textual element must be uh, within the text must be commented or else don't use it okay all uh, non-textual elements should have a consistent look see so how, how do you know what is a consistent look look at the submission to guideline for the publication what is the standard that is used okay uh, how is the table design is it using only horizontal line only vertical line or is it in a box frame or how is it uh, what kind of font that is being used aerial news roman uh, news time new times roman uh, is he using small cap uh, sentence casing or is it in block uh, so careful so what kind of fonts don't do any fancy fonts uh, and then where the tables is coming from is it your own data if it's your own you must mention it if it is not you have to give credit source from where the citation of the table and figures must be credited as well if it is not yours so discussing or interpreting your results can be uh, a problem that you can get uh, if you did not design the findings correctly so you want to avoid some of this problem your interpretation save save the discussion as i've said in the next uh, section which is a discussion section so so this comp this part is only for you to uh, show the results without biases as i've said earlier okay so reporting, uh, oops, sorry. So reporting background information or attempting to explain your, your findings. Uh, so this again, be careful because uh, you have done a lot of the background discussion in the introduction. So your results section, uh, you should avoid doing that. So often the result uh, of a study uh, point to the need to provide additional background sometimes but you don't have to uh, put it too much okay just some very basic information because uh, people can actually go back and refer back to the introduction that is why when we first started uh, this class we mentioned to you that uh, you may come back to the introduction chapter again towards the end because you want to ensure your introduction ties with your result another thing that you need to avoid when doing a result section is you're trying to avoid negative result. If let's say you're doing a quantitative research study and you want to prove 
the four hypotheses that you want you are trying to prove. And from the study, you found all the hypotheses is not supported. Or maybe two supported, another two is not supported. So that doesn't mean that you only present the hypothesis that is supported. Even though you have a negative result, you must present it. If some of your results fail to support your hypothesis, doesn't matter. You do not ignore them. You document them, then state in your discussion section why you believe um, a negative result has emerged from your study. So note that uh, negative result and how you handle them often provides you with, uh, with opportunity to write a more engaging discussion section. So don't be afraid to highlight them if you have negative result. That is part and parcel of what research is all about. Next one. Next problem, including that you should avoid is how you handle your raw data or the intermediate calculation. Determine if you need to include any raw data generated uh, by your study, okay? For instance, if you're doing a qualitative research, uh, the transcript of your interview, do you need them? You may need part and part of it for your discussion, but if you want to include them, you can put it right at the back in the appendix, not as part of the publication. Be as factual and concise as possible in reporting your findings. Do not use phrases that are very vague or, or non-specific. Uh, don't use the words like, um, the findings appeared to be greater or lesser than, appeared to be. There's no such thing as appeared to be or demonstrates uh, promising trends. No, you've got to be exactly. There's no gray, gray line here, yes or no, black or white. So that's the finding must be based on the data. Presenting the same data or repeating the same information more than once. Don't do that as well. So that's another problem you have to avoid, as I've said earlier. The same information is discussed uh, in the form of a text in a paragraph. And then you see certainly a table appearing showing the same data. And then you see another chart is drawn that is also showing the same data. So don't repeat the information. Don't confuse between figures with table. Make sure you know when to use a figure and when to use a table. So these are some basic things that you should know by now. And then the lastly, the last part here uh, before I hand over, uh, why don't I just combine the result with the discussion section? Nothing wrong to do that. So it is not unusual where the authors have combined the description of the findings uh, from the study with the discussion about their implication. So this is Nothing wrong in doing that. However, if you are inexperienced writing research paper, you want to consider the two sections separately, okay? So that it is easier to manage. But once you are experienced writing, you can do it concurrently, okay? So think of the result section is, uh, of the result is where you, you report what you study found and think of the discussion section as the place where you interpret the so what question that I mentioned to you earlier. So as you become more and more skillful in the way you write the paper, then you can actually uh, bring this both result and discussion at the same time, okay? So that uh, the reader is able to immediately understand what this finding basically is all about. All right, so that's a big snapshot on um, what results section is all about. And, uh, and we will do more discussion at the end if you have any questions. So for now, let me hand over the second part of the discussion to Ms. Pairo Nizan on the library support in writing a research result. Over to you. Okay, thank you, okay. Andre. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. For today's topic on writing the results, we will look at guides and handbooks available in the library collections open access resources and tools available for data visualization and finding data set that you might want to reuse for your own research. So in this and the next slides, you will list out uh, ebooks with hyperlinks on guides and handbooks useful as reference for today's topic. For this third and WOU library user to access and read these ebooks, just log into the digital library. So you can see the next slide is uh, ebooks that you can access. And also next slide please, ebooks on interpretation of research results, 
data analysis, and also on data visualization and learning analytics. Next slide, please. Okay, we also listed out open sources for ebooks and reference and relevant websites that can be used for reference on writing the results or finding of your research. So you just click on the link and you can access the open resource for your reference. Next slide, please. Okay. On the screen, we have selected some data visualization tools with hyperlinks to their website that can be used to convert data sources into a visual representation, uh, such as charts, graph, maps, or tables. This is to present statistical significance of the results. Some of the tools are available free. Some provide free trial access that requires you to sign up to an account with limited features and also support on Excel for Microsoft 365. These tools help to transform raw data into useful charts and graph. So you can just uh, have a look at the tools available and choose which tools is appropriate for you to use. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a list of guides that have been designed to help you to find third party open access research data set that you might want to reuse for your own research. On this page, you will find open data repositories which provide information and data about specific search engine and databases. This is useful in finding suitable data archive. Next, please. Okay, this is an example, a screenshot for Google Dataset Search. So Google Dataset Search is a search engine from Google that helps researchers locate online data available for you to use. It takes users to where the data is located. It covers topics mostly on social sciences, geoscience, biology, agriculture, humanities, medicine, mechanical engineering, chemistry, computer science and construction engineering. These data are either licenses access or open data. So using a simple keyword search, you can type in the search box. The user can discover data set hosted in thousands of repositories across the web. Okay, these data sets are easy to find when you provide supporting information such as their name, description, creator, and distribution format. You can filter the results based on the type of data set that you need. Okay, next please. Okay, you can also filter the search results to display only free data set or only uh, data source, open source uh, database. Okay, each display data set will provide description of the database that you are viewing. Okay, next please. Okay, as you can see on the screen, files that can be accessed will be displayed either available to be downloaded or you need to request for it. Okay, next please. Okay, if the files mark as Request access, you will need to provide some information as part of the data set before you can access the files. Okay, next, please. Okay, another example on the screen access or to data set on ecotourism collected from government open data sources. So you can see the file there that you is able you to download the data from the website. Okay, next please. Again, okay, another example of display is a data set of responses from a survey. So you can download the files. Next please. And this is what you will see in the next screen. So you can see the data set available for you to download and you can reuse the information for your own research if needed. Okay, next please. Okay, on display, a list of resources for lesson seven which consists of books and online links that you can click on the hyperlink to access. Okay, thank you very much. And I pass back the session to Pongi. Thank you, Farun Nizan. So, uh, so you see there are a lot of resources available out there. If you, if you notice uh, the data set search 
more and more journal uh, lately. Uh, I'm not sure if you have published lately, you'd realize that many journals now require you to submit your data set. So they're not going to just uh, take your publication based on what you have analyzed and submit. They want the data set. They want a proof of the actual analysis. Uh, so that is why when you're doing a data set search through the library as well, you are able to get access to some of this data. Uh, if you want to run different analysis, I want to use the same data or I want to improve on the data and run uh, and do a longitudinal study Okay, from certain period. I have a data. Now I want to run the same test afterward. Let's say you, you have a set of tests done uh, pre-COVID period. Now I want to do it post-COVID period with the same, same parameters. And then I want to see a, a difference. So, so that's how the data set is actually is very useful. So those of you who are uh, thinking to publish, you have to keep your data set. So it doesn't mean that once you finish your research, you can throw your data set. No. You have to keep it for a period of time, normally about five years, you have to keep it. Uh, if there's some dispute or someone uh, says that you have falsified your research, you have access to your raw data. So you always keep, especially if you're doing your master's or PhD, you have to keep your data for a period of time because people can challenge you after, your, after you get your PhD after four or five years and someone challenged the, the data that you have collected. So you have to always keep this data set uh, active. All right, so now I shall open the floor uh, for any questions from the rest. Uh, if you have questions or feedback, either you can put it in the chat or you can just uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Any question, anybody uh, in the midst of uh, doing their publication or working on their publication and has some questions? No questions. Everyone is very clear. Everyone's still in the holiday mood. All right. Okay, for those of you uh, who have missed, uh, no worries. Uh, uh, I know there's a lot of them have registered, but there are some, many of them are still on leave, but we will still send a recording to all those uh, who have missed the session uh, so that they still get access to the, the research uh presentation that we have done today so in our next class in two weeks from today uh, we are going to talk about uh, the discussion section before we move into the conclusions we got two more sessions before we uh, conclude the the first uh, fundamental uh, series uh, we will have following series uh, focusing on some other aspect but this is the first set of the uh, session that we have organized uh, for you. So we hope to uh, have more sessions like this. If you have, uh, if you have a particular area that you want us to, to look at, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact us and we will uh, plan to organize it. Even if you don't have the expertise, we will find the expertise in the area that you think that you need help on. All right then. So uh, thank you once again for taking time for your afternoon today. And thank you, Faruniza, for, for having the session today with us. And we will see you again uh, in two weeks from today. So have a good weekend and, and stay safe as always. Bye-bye.